Why, hello there. I didn't see you come in. Well, while you're here, I should let you know that today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Andrew, tell us a little bit about Patreon. Patreon's a place you can go if you'd like to support us and help us keep the show running, as well as receive some extra content like commentaries and after parties for certain episodes and some other stuff. All right. Our current patrons are Stephanie L., Terry Needleman, La- Max Lunig. Benjamin Learher, Lily Ackles, Mackenzie Horner, John Donna, Taryn the Duck, Melissa Goldman, Jess Lightning, Ewan Casty, Haley McDonald, Taskier, Callum McLeod, Fire of September, Mina Maniri, Monica Thoreau, Brent Black, Haley Murray, Alice in Wonderland, B Way Flicks, Michael Johan, Nathaniel, Stacey Coombe, Joseph Evans Green, and Luna Rocks 222. Um, every time I say see Michael Johan, I want to say Michael Jordan, which is bad. Um, but they give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you'd like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks such as patron-only commentaries, our episodes a day earlier or even earlier, come join us over at Patreon. Andrew, is there anything else you want to say before we head on into the show? Thank you, Michael Jordan. Yes, thank you, Michael Jordan. Come on and slam. Welcome to the jam. <laughs> Alright, let's get back to the show. Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater. How are you doing today, Andrew? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing today? Quite well, quite well. It's excellent. Uh, oh, yeah, you're good. That's excellent. Uh, it's you, really you have, good to hear. You you have nothing nothing that you want to say that's wacky or anything like that? No, there's nothing wacky to say about today's subject. Uh, would you agree? Um... Oh my gosh, my my shirt. It's it's what color is it? Oh, it's purple. No, actually I can see you right now. It's more of like a white. Fuck off. Like God a tan, like a tan. It's definitely not purple. Okay. Okay, we're talking about the color purple this week. There's nothing wacky about this topic, Jess, okay? If you think the color purple and you think, "Man, this is something that could be full of humor. This is like a funny topic." Like, I don't know what to tell you. There's nothing funny to say about the color purple. I disagree. There's a couple funny moments. Word. To discuss it ain't worth a big fuss whatever comes to us is in god's hands when i lay me down to sleep i will say my prayer that god love me so deep he will promise our souls to keep together i'll say a prayer the color of purple is a musical with a book by Marsha Norman and music and lyrics by Brenda Russell, Allie Willis, and Stephen Bray. Based on the 1982 novel the same name by Alice Walker and its 1985 film adaptation, the, th- the musical follows the journey of Celie, an African-American woman in the American South from the early to mid-20th century. The original Broadway production ran from 2005 to 2008, earning 11 Tony Award nominations. An enthusiastically acclaimed Broadway revival opened in late 2015 and ran through early 2017, winning two 2016 Tony Awards, including Best Revival of a Musical and Best Actress in a Musical. Which is a pretty big thing, considering this was the year of Hamilton, where it was less Hamilton fever, so yeah, that's great. Andrew, what is, your, what is the plot of The Color Purple? All right, well, going into this, I didn't, I've never seen the Color Purple movie or read the book or known anything about it whatsoever other than that it's like, it was a very famous movie, I think. Directed by Steven Spielberg, yes. Yes. Which is the wrong choice for that movie, but we'll talk about that later. It was critically acclaimed, I think, so. It it got critics uh, against it for like, why did Spielberg direct this? I mean, he did that Holocaust movie, right? Yeah. That that doesn't mean you can tell the color purple from like a meaningful place. But either way, what is the plot of a color purple? Um. Okay. Well, there's the girl. There's like a bunch of girls actually. <laughs> there's two sisters, and they live somewhere in the south, Georgia. In, the, in yeah, and the girl's daughters or children or babies get taken away by her dad. I think her dad is also the father of those children. Fun fact. Okay, well, I didn't know that. And that fucked up? <laughs> I mean, that's fine. That's fair. It's fucked up, but yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I guess that makes it his right to take those kids <laughs> and throw them in the dumpster or wherever he puts them. <laughs> I don't know he, where he ends he up sent, them. He basically kind of sells them for work, seems like. Yeah, he sells them, and then they end up in Africa, but that's later. <laughs> All right. Um, then he sells his daughter. 
into like, marriage. Yes, into marriage with a me- big meanie named Mr. Meanie. <laughs> his Mr. name's Mr. His name's Mr. Jackass. Beats his <laughs> wife, piece of shit. Asshole. Beats his wife, rapes his wife. Terrible tries, person. Tries to rape his wife's sister. Lots of... This guy's full of good deeds. <laughs> He's a hero. No. Um... And the other sister is gonna teach her kids. She wants to teach. She becomes a missionary in Africa. Yep. And tries and to teach people things. There's some other characters, but they don't really do anything, so I'm not gonna mention them. Well, Seely, who is our lead character, is forced into this marriage of Mister, who already has a bunch of kids already, and so she has to help raise these children. And they go through high drinks, like his son Harpo, like falls in love with this boisterous, intense woman called Sophia. Um, and he doesn't know how to control her, and so Celia is like, "You should beat her." And so when he tries, apparently she beats the shit out of him worse. I mean, that was not a good idea. He shouldn't have done that. Um. So yeah, she gets pissed at Celia for telling her him to beat her, and then. She goes off for a while to let off some steam, and in that time, Harpo finds another woman that Andrew loves so much. I think her name's Squeak? Yeah. She's... Whose dog's louder, mine or yours? Let's fight. Dog fight! Dog fight! Uh, Basically, Squeak has the worst voice I've ever heard in anything, ever, and I don't know why they would intentionally have someone talk that way. I don't think it's that bad because of the voice itself. I think it's worse because it seems fake. Like, there are some squeaky voices out there, like Steve Urkel. Like, but that comes from an actual place in his, like, register, and most of the actresses who play Squeak are just going way out of their register to sound kind of annoying, as opposed to, like... Like, I generally just have an annoying high-pitched voice, and so when I kind of pitch it up like that and all that, it kind of feels natural, where it's like, ah, it just feels weird. I hate it. <laughs> it was it was probably the worst part of the show for me. Mm-hmm. Like, every single time that character opened their mouth, I was like, man, <laughs> I hope she dies or something. Like, oh my god, holy shit. I, no, I mean, I can't, I can't handle that. It's annoying, and she wasn't even... She didn't even really have that much of a character. She was in it for, like, two scenes. She wanted but, to be a singer, Andrew. Yeah, well, she's not allowed to talk, let alone sing, in my <laughs> in my eyes. Um, what do you think about the main... The the love interest of this story, Shug Avery? Um, as played by Grizabella the Glamour Cat. Yeah, she's alright. I, I don't know. Feels like she doesn't have that much of a purpose for a lot of it. Ah, it, it, it is complicated, because in this musical and in Steven Spielberg's movie, they really tone down how explicitly Seely is romantically and sexually engaged in a love affair with Suge Avery. Yeah, I mean, they just kind of kiss, and I thought that was, like, out of nowhere, and I wasn't even sure it was romantic or not, and then like, that was, like, the only thing that happened. Okay, let me tell you a bit about the book. Like, so Seely describes every sexual experience she has as, like, someone going to the bathroom. Like, I just lay there and let them be done with it. And then Suge Avery enters her life. She's like, sex is great. And she's like, you ever look at your vagina before? And then they go into this scene where she pulls out a mirror and lets Seely look at her own vagina. And she describes it as, like, wet rose petals. Like, that, that's some specific things from the book. And it's a little bit more, like, very, they're kind of settling down together and they're kind of married but hiding their actual intentions. So that when Suge Avery goes off into the night, like, I want to have one last fling, it means a lot more. Like, you just, I'm not enough for you. You need to go fuck someone. Whereas here, since it's more, like, subtle, it's more than they have in the movie, which is nothing at all. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit more, but... <laughs> they kiss. It... They hold hands. They talk about sex and how nice it is. And Suge Avery has a song in the musical called Push the Button, which in the book is the way that she describes the clitoris, where she's yeah. like, above your vagina, there is a button that you just got to push to make, make things feel good. And so kind of side eye, they make an entire song about the clitoris. Yeah, it's like, book it's of like Mormon. a Book of Mormon before it happened. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and I think think that that number, despite be my knowledge making it a little kind of like, ah, that 
that's a little dirtier than I think they're intending it to be. I mean, I think they're intending it to be dirty, but just dirty, but like without saying it. Right, right, right. I don't um, know. It kind of feels like they shy away from the whole thing and it basically ruins that aspect of it. A little bit, honestly. Because it's like, if it's not, if you're, if you're making something that is that explicit and you're adapting it with, but like removing almost all of it, like. But they also have scenes where she's like naked and bathing her and she's talking about how in, she feels tingles down her spine just by touching her body and all that. Like they have stuff like that. In this? Yeah, they do. In this. I don't, I don't think I remember that. Yeah, it's the first time Shug comes on and she's like, has to take her out of her dress and bathe her. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. She's like, oh my god, this woman feels incredible, like, unlike any of the other girls I've seen. Like, it, there's more than nothing, but it still doesn't feel like enough. Yeah. Man, this story is just not up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> just because you don't know how to make jokes about it or just because... <clears throat> No, it's just not something I'm interested in anyway. <laughs> Why? I don't, I usually don't, I don't like content that is explicitly sexual and especially that type of thing is a little uncomfortable and, you know, I don't know. I think you're just lame. I'm a prude, um, I'm a prude. But I'll, you didn't like the it. character of Mr. and his redemption arc, so to say? Because he does have a legitimate redemption, so more than most people do, more than Kylo yeah, Ren did. But he's not redeemable, though, is the problem. Yes, they take him so far that he's not redeemable, but they he tries. He tries to put the effort in. I suppose, but, like, it's too too little too late, you know? He gives Seely the emotional catharsis in the end to bring her sister, his sister back, her sister back to her. But he's the one that drove her away in the first place. So. Exactly. It's very <laughs> Tony Stark of him to be like, I fixed, I saved the day from the problem I caused. I caused the issue and now I fixed it. And I also <laughs> did all these other things that I didn't fix, but I know. fixed this thing. It's like, great. Good for you, mister. Also, what was with the curse thing? Like, was he actually cursed? Is there, like, real voodoo magic going on, or...? I mean, I think it's just in his head, more or less. Like, his life was on a downhill turn anyways, and she also just cursed him, so he thinks there's a correlation, so to say. That's kind of how I interpreted it, but it, it made it seem like there was actually, like, a real curse, and it was weird. <laughs> It was weird. Um, in the book, it is very interesting how this book is written because it takes place from the point of view of Seely, and it's written within her mindset. So there's the same misspellings that you would expect from someone of her. I don't want to say her level, but like someone of her reading level that probably wasn't able to go to school, like unlike her sister Nettie. So her reading and writing comprehension skills are rudimentary, and she has like her own language. Like instead of saying are they, they just say is. Like, we is gonna be this, like, and most of the words are spelt wrong, lowercase, and all that. And it's a very interesting way that adds a lot of verisimilitude to the story and gives you a lot into your protagonist eyes. It's weird when they talk like that in the in the musical. Yeah, no. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's probably how that character would actually talk. They didn't go to school, they didn't, they don't understand. Yeah, I guess. But to me, it's just like, to my, like, you know how she says, dear God, and like, she's constantly saying letters to God. It's weird in the musical, but in the book, that's just, she doesn't want to say dear diary, so she's literally writing these words out to God. It makes it seem, it does make it seem more like she's actually writing to God. Yeah. As opposed to just talking to God. I mean, what's, what's your what's your thought on the whole story and everything? Well, the story itself, I think, doesn't work. At, I, I was frustrated with this musical because I felt like all the emotional beats are happening. They're just nowhere near as satisfying as they are in that's, the book. Yeah, that's kind of how I was feeling. I was like, this story feels like it should be really connecting with me and it's not at all connecting in and any let's way. add the caveat that we're both white men and we probably don't understand a lot of the nuances here so let's add that caveat right there fair enough and i think that the story is very well told in the book i think it's badly told in the movie i think it's better told in the musical but still all those emotional beats aren't quite there yet hmm. it just yeah i think the musical it feels meandering like it doesn't feel like any yeah. of these characters are quite as present as they should be. Like, what do we know about Harpo aside from the fact that he feels scared by his wife? Basically nothing. And you don't know much about his wife other than that she's loud. Well, she's loud and she doesn't... I think she gets more development than Harpo does because she says... She gets a bit more. I have to fight through everything and all that and, like, I'm not going to fight in my own goddamn house. 
you really don't know much about any of the characters. Like, even the main character is just kind of there, it feels like, a lot of times. I disagree. I feel like she gets the most. She has a very clear-cut goal. I want to see my sister. I want to see my child. Yes. But I'm ugly and no one will ever love me. And then in the end, she's like, I get my children back. I get my sister back. And you know what? I am beautiful and I'm good enough to be here and live on my own. She has a very clear arc. Mister, she gets the most. Everyone Mister else has around the her. the second most because he has an arc in a different place at the end. Yeah, and he gets the villain arc. And... Redemptive villain. Sort of. He redeemed, tries his best. <laughs> redeemed in a way, although I would still say that as a person he is... A piece of shit? Yes. Absolutely still a piece of shit, whether he fixed it or not. <laughs> but I... the thing is... I mean, you also have these other characters like Squeak, who yeah. is just nothing. I mean, Squeak and, and, uh, and the son, Mr. Son, is just... I, what was his name? It was, uh... Harpo! Harpo, we just said it. <laughs> They're both just, like, nothing characters, like... You but the just... thing is, they they work when you're actually seeing it from the point of view of Seeley writing it down in a journal, like, he's gonna see this girl, like, as, like, that kind of thing. A character like that works. But in a, a narrative story told on stage, where your stage time is precious, and it's not like this is a super long musical, like, compared to our other stuff, it's pretty short. It's under two hours, I think. Yeah. So, honestly, I think we could trim her up, give Harpo and Sophia a bit more time to grow together. Mm-hmm. And maybe a little bit more Shug Avery time. Definitely more Shug time. Because, honestly, I feel like she wasn't even well-developed. I feel like they were afraid to develop her, and that's a weird thing to say. Yeah, it's like they didn't want to touch her. It's like they don't they don't want to go near that, because they probably understand that it's a little bit... It's a, it's a topic that doesn't really uh, work well mm -hmm. uh, with the mainstream audience, so... Yes. But one of the interesting, or at least in a Broadway audience, which is weird because, you know... I mean, it probably could work, but they probably were afraid to do it wrong or anything Especially like that. Especially in, like, 2005 when this show premiered. Yeah, and it's little... like, if they if they didn't do it right, it would get a huge amount of backlash, and... Yeah. So it's just, like, better to just not do it, and then... I think it's done very well in the book, though. I'll say that. You so, guys have a blueprint right there. Just follow the fucking br blueprint. Yeah. But Alice Walker is probably one of the best writers of all time, and it's hard to live up to that. I get that. Yeah. It just, it kind of meanders. Um, the story just doesn't feel well told. Um, but let me say some things I enjoy about the source material in general. When you hear the color purple and you think, what would that story be about? It's about um, black people in the South in the early, I want to say, 18, 1900s, maybe? Like 19, late I mean, 19th there's, century, there's early 20th century. There's definitely an actual time period, mm -hmm. but I don't really know exactly when it is. Oh, I'm sure it's written down somewhere in my synopsis. Mid, it's the mid 20th century, so... But they don't really deal with racism. They don't deal with white people bringing them down or anything like that. That's well, not there, the story. There is no white people in the story. Well, that's good, honestly. Like, well, I mean, it's it's a different subject matter because I mean we have plenty of stories about racism and about that. So it's it's doing something different, which is nice. That's kind of what I'm saying. Like, that's one of my favorite things about the color purple is it's kind of. How often do you see a story about African American people in the mid 20th century and not have anyone like say some racist stuff and then everyone bands together and be like, we will not stand for this? And as much as those stories are great and wonderful, can't we just see them living their own lives, being lesbians and having, having parties and arguing with each other like actual human beings do? Yeah, and the the one thing with those stories too is that it's always putting it's always a story putting black people in the perspective of white people hate them or whatever, which is like it's like can't they have their own thing that isn't based on how white people feel about them? Yeah, like, can honestly. We have a, can we have a story that is about black people that isn't about how white people feel about them? Right, and not not that that doesn't have its place, but like Something like Hairspray, I think I'd prefer a lot more if it just, like, wasn't so direct about, like, racism, like, in this specific TV studio, comparing racism to being a fat white girl, which, no, no, that's not how that works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a little bit iffy, but okay. Um, so, I like this, I appreciate that in this story, both in the book <coughs> and in this musical, that, that, at even at its highest, is mostly subtext. Yeah. Um, and if it was there even a little bit, it's mostly just the stage, the setting for you. 
Well, yeah, because I mean, obviously, that still is a major part of their lives, I'm sure. But it's not the only thing that the story needs to be about. It can be about the other stuff that happens. Yeah, and I'm glad it's not a story about misery in the sense that that they're miserable throughout the entire time. Like, Celie has a hard life and is given a lot of shit to deal with, and it's disgusting what happens to her. But she ends up on top, owning her own business, and being successful and happy in the end. And that's fucking great. No, it's a good story. I'm, I think more so talking about the musical, though, I'm not sure how well the musical does it. Yes, and that's kind of where I'm sitting. Um, but the one thing I think the musical really does bring to the table that is fantastic is the actual music. And want to go into a mid-show and talk about that after it? Yeah, sure. Hey, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we got a shill at you. Our current patrons are Stephanie L., Terry Needleman, Max Lunig, Benjamin Lear, Lily Ackles, Mackenzie Horner, John Donna, Taryn the Duck, Melissa Goldman, Jess Lightning, hashtag the best Jess, Ewan Casty, Haley McDonald, Taskier, Callum McLeod, Fire of September, Mina Maniri, Monica Thoreau, Brent Black, Haley Murray, Alice in Wonderland, Sean O'Neill, B-Way Flicks, Michael Johan, Nathaniel Stacy Coombe, Joseph Evan Green, and Luna Rocks 222. They all give us a little financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese. If you'd like to join them in supporting us and get tons of fun perks such as patron-only commentaries, our episodes a day early or even earlier, come join us over at Patreon. All right, you ready to get back to the show, Andrew? Absolutely. Picture me in the schoolhouse with my college degree. I can teach all my children to spell ten. You can have Celia, though. She too old be living at home. Maybe I'll have a garden where birds come to sing. I don't want Celia. I'm a finch from a sparrow. She ugly. Fix a broken wing. Wanna hear your bird sing. Wanna hear school bell ring. No matter what life bring, I send God's hand. I want to talk about our prayer because I love this song a lot. Sure. It is basically Nettie and Celie's song together that ties them, and it keeps reprising every time they come back. And yes, it doesn't feel patronizing either. Like a lot of those little kid, like we're growing up together, we're happy songs feel really patronizing. Specifically, the one I'm thinking of is a deleted song from Frozen, where it was like, "It's so hard to be a princess," da, 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 and they have like this slap clapping thing, and it feels so pedantic. Well, I mean, they already have Do You Want to Build a Snowman, which is already kind of the similar thing. Yeah, even that kind of feels a little too, like... Patronizing. Yeah, whereas this is just like, I just like saying a prayer with you and going and hanging with you. Like, a call and response type song, like Do You Want to Build a Snowman, but it feels natural and of the world. Yeah. I want to say, before we even get into all the songs, that I yeah. like I like the music style they went with. Yes. It's like a kind of jazzy gospel type feel. Is that a, do you think that's a good way to describe yes. it? It's a type of thing where you can cheer in the middle of it and it feels so natural. Um, and I think that is, especially for the setting and the mm -hmm. characters, is very fitting. Um, so I think that works pretty well. A musical style that I don't know I love about this is, it feels like they kind of have a Greek chorus within like themselves where they're like, describing what's going on like oh he beats her like a dog you know those types of st storytelling yeah. characters i don't much care for them i kind of would rather just the story unfold without them spitting the story at me i'm wondering if that's just them having trouble taking the book and putting it into a narrative when based on how you're saying the book was written that's not yeah. really an easy thing to do and i can see that too i just if that feels like i'm being spoon fed and i don't particularly like that all the time that's kind of how i feel in a veto with che despite the fact that i kind of like che but it is kind of spoon feeding you either an opinion or plot it does make this story a little easier to follow especially for someone who doesn't know the story at all right right <laughs> but it's like instead of just saying he beats her like a dog just have her like have him beat her or something like that. I mean, that sounds terrible, but... Well, I mean, that's what you said. That's what you want her to, him to do, so... <laughs> no! No. It's... A lot of the things that happen in this maybe are better left on scene and said instead, but 
a lot of it just feels like a series of vignettes instead of a story until the end it turns out hey you are in a story well i mean if you're gonna if you're gonna tell the story and, and you're gonna shy away from showing us all the stuff that happens i mean why even tell the story because it's a musical and we go to a musical, come on, forget your troubles, come on, get happy, that kind of mindset. And I get that mindset, too. Who's going to the color purple to get happy? Hey, there's some fun songs in here. Yeah, sure, but the story is depressing. It, yeah, it is not the most fun story in the world, I agree. If I'm going to a musical to get happy, this is not the one I would see. What would you see? Beetlejuice. <laughs> Too late, you can't see that no more. I know. Sad. I'm actually sad about that. You got you got to go see the Music Man starring huge jackass. I hope they bring back Beetlejuice. Uh, I don't think the story's over. It'll be in community theaters and all that. I hope they tour with it or something. Oh, they will. That's already been announced. I want to see it. Yeah. Speaking of great things, let's talk about Hell No. Oh. Well, what you ought to do is bash Mr.'s head open and think on heaven later. You can't stay here, girl. Sister! Hell no. That's Sophia's song. big song. I mean, it's it's big and boisterous like her character, so. Mm -hmm. And that's a straight up quote from both the book and the movie, because I remember Oprah Winfrey played this role in the movie. And I think it was like her first film role. Man, these dogs, somebody's just <laughs> got to off them. Somebody's got to just take them and throw them off a cliff. <laughs> the dog fight! <laughs> bark, bark, shut up. <laughs> No, oh. Hell No is a really good character song, and it, mm -hmm. it definitely embodies her character better than anything else. And it's just like, we need this moment. We need this moment of someone standing up for themselves. Because at this point, Seeley comes off as someone that's kind of like, I'm going to deflect, I'm going to take it all in, like, I, this is my life and what I got to go through. And... Everybody's just completely been passive the entire show so far. Well, I guess this is what this may as well happen is basically what yeah our main character has been doing. Then she sees Sophia be like, "No, I am not going to let anyone beat me or touch <gasps> me or hurt me. I am going to fight back and leave if I need to." And Steely's inspired by this to like start growing some backbone and grow a resolve and stop telling people to beat each other. Yeah, don't don't tell people to beat their wife, please. It's not a That's, good thing. Yeah, it's, mm. Especially not when you're in that situation as well. But then again, if you're... It's hard for me to speak from the point of view of the abused. Well, I'm just giving advice. I'm just saying don't do that, you know? <laughs> I'm just saying I'm right, you know? I mean, I am right. Always. You shouldn't do, you shouldn't do that. I mean, I think that is a, an objective point. You shouldn't tell people to beat their wives. Fine. Yep, I, I'm willing to agree with you there. So I am correct in this situation, so... I mean... <laughs> Chuck Avery coming to town. That's a fun song. That song is really fun. And it like when it makes you really want to see her and then you see her and it's Grizabella the Glamour Cat. And you're like, wow. You're like, wow. Is she going to sing Memory? Memory. Like that's basically. She does not sing Memory, by the way. No, no, no. She sings other songs and she she's a lot of fun to watch. And it's good to have like a woman with sexual agency not portrayed as like a slut. Yep. She's not just like, I want to fuck everyone, like, in the way of, like, usual kind of promiscuous characters on Broadway. Who are you thinking of? Um, I'm thinking a lot of, like, the prostitutes from Les Mis, specifically. Like, lovely ladies, blah, 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 blah. So you're not thinking of Rum Tum Tugger, or... Who is... He is also a slut. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Let's see, what else is good to talk about?
I want to talk about Push the Button. Go ahead. I don't think I have anything to say about this song, to be honest. It's a, it's about f- masturbating. Yeah, I mean, that's good. We should have more songs about masturbating. It's an we important really part should. of life. There's a we lot sh- of There's a lot of people that masturbate, n- namely everyone. And anyone hey, who says hey. that they don't is lying. I have never touched myself before in my life, Andrew DeWolf. Okay, well, I mean, maybe someone like Jess who doesn't have hands doesn't masturbate, but everyone <laughs> else does. Hey, so we should some have some more songs. Pfft. Some people can't can't come, you know, that's a thing. Especially a lot of women have a lot of trouble with that, so that's you know, performance anxiety is a it's a serious problem. You and know some men have innies and not outies. Man, remember when we talked about twisted? It's been too yeah. long. Yeah. We should do another Star Kid one and just talk about all the jokes we liked, you know, have the most boring episode in the world again. Yeah. All right, well, push the button. What did you like about this song? It's just a fun number, like a fun, like, sexy number that isn't, like, slut shamey. Like, a good sexual number that feels, like, kind of soulful and gospely. Lyrically, what did you think of it, though? It's fine. Do you, do you think they could have had more masturbation puns? Yes, they could have had more masturbation puns. You can always have more masturbation that's, puns. That's kind of what I was thinking. They didn't really play it up enough. Have you have you listened to, to Lady Gaga's Dancing in Circles? Like... Come on, that's that's how you do a, a masturbation pun. That's how you do it. Gotta listen to the Lady Gaga's. Yeah, I love Lady Gaga's. Like a blade of corn, like a honeybee, like a waterfall, all a part of me, like the color purple. Where do you? The color purple, you know, the title number. Title number? I, I it didn't have that much impact on me, I'll be honest. I like it because of its view of God. Um, basically, it starts with show, Celie describing her vision of God and like how God has forgotten her and how terrible her life is. And Suge is like, you know what? God isn't a guy. He's not a person. He's just everything that you see. Like, from, like, a blade of grass to the actual shade of the color purple. It's not a man, it's an idea, and it's, like, everything we create. And it's, like, it's weird to hear a gospel song that isn't, that is about God, but not directly about God the man, but God the idea. Which is, to me, very, kind of, I don't, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, subversive. It is a subversive twist on that idea. So I think it's as like the title number for this show and how it kind of makes me feel. I think it's super powerful and interesting. I suppose lyrically. I think the music is kind of just, eh, didn't really leave me with a huge impact. I can hum it. Like it sticks with me and I haven't, I don't like listen to this song a ton, but I do like it and I can hum it. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Never see nobody I know ever again. Nobody to put up with me. Nobody to mess with me, nobody to push me around, nobody to tell me what to do, nobody expect something of me, nobody to tell me who I am and who I ain't. Nobody! I got plenty to blame. My daddy beat me for my own good, he say. My first wife got killed when she ran away. My kids is all fools, my crops is all dead Only woman I love won't lie in my bed A black man's life can't get any worse Lest he wasting away under Miss Silly's curse Alright, you want to talk about the Mr. Song? I just want to talk about how weird this song is Because it's like, he's cursed <laughs> All right, so explain the situation of this song. Mister gets cursed by Celie when he when she leaves, and then bad stuff happens to Mister, and he thinks he's actually cursed, and that's this song. <laughs> but he also gives history, like he's like my dad beat me when I was a kid. Like I know. Oh yeah, like, it's like he's he's trying to redeem himself and stuff. Describing why he's such a bad man that rapes his wife and beats his wife and beats his kids and beats everyone because he's a bad person. Yeah. Basically, he's like, my dad was a bad person and the people around me were bad people, so now I'm a bad person. And it's okay that I'm a bad person because I have this sad, sad backstory, don't you know? Yeah. Although I guess eventually he realizes that that's not 
true in that he doesn't get to just be a bad person because everyone else was bad to him. Right. And that's a lesson he has to learn and he makes actual amends with it. Unlike other people that just kind of in other stories where it's like, I'm a good person now. Believe me, I'm going to be nice to you. Where he's like, he asked Celie to marry him properly again. And she's like, no, we should just be friends. And you actually believe that they're decent friends now. And in the book, it's much more like like that, where they are just kind of buddies after despite having been married. Well, yeah. And I mean, the initial marriage was kind of a farce. Oh, 100 percent a farce. So, although I guess back back then that may have been more of a actual way to get married. Yeah, just, you just get sold. Just get sold into marriage, you, like you a fiddler a, on the a, roof kind of thing. You get a cow with your wife. Uh, I get two cows in one go. Oh man! Hey! <laughs> I know the musical says it, but it's not cool when you say it. No. Ah. Uh. I don't think there's any more songs I want to talk about. One song I want to talk about. Okay, what do you got? I'm Here might be one of my favorite musical theater solo numbers, like, of all time. It is incredible. Okay, well, go it ahead. It is a powerhouse performance that anyone that performs it is truly owns this. It's Rose's turn, basically. Rose's turn is very good, so... I think this is as good as Rose's turn and as a tour de force of performance. Because basically, what happens is she is rejected by the one woman he she thought loved her, and then she's like, what do I even have if I don't have her? And she's like, okay, I've got my sister. I I haven't seen her in Europe, but I know that I've got her. I've got my kids, and I got my house. And then she, throughout this song, she realizes, I don't need anyone to prove to me that I'm worth it. And she comes to terms with like, I, I'm beautiful, I'm wonderful, I'm great, and I'm here, and you people are going to get used to me being here because I'm fucking great. And for two uglies like you and me, that's a good message. I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's a definitely a good message. And it's emotional. Like, um, Cynthia Revo, who performs this in the most recent production, breaks my heart, and now she's nominated for an Oscar this year for playing Harriet Tubman. So, like... I think this song number alone is what led to her big breakout film career and how great she is now. And I think this song is part of the reason why this show has lasted so long, because this song is so fucking powerful that by the end of it, you're like, I just had an experience. And I feel like this song would resonate a lot more with me personally if they had kept all the emotional beats found in the book, as opposed to cutting so much and adding, like... And focusing a little too much on, like, the other minor characters of the book. Yeah. I think a lot of the songs would resonate better if it wasn't... If eh. it had focused more on the... Because it is an interesting character dynamic. You have this woman who's forced into marriage to this guy, and this guy is in love with this woman, and the woman falls in love with his wife. That is the plot of this, if we're focusing... Like, on the whole, that's an interesting plot. But there's never really any emotional interaction... Between Mr. and Shug and uh, Seely. Except for them just telling us that they're in love, which is a problem. You want to see like him, aside from just getting dressed nice when Shug comes around, you want to see him like doing things for her that 
she, he never did for Seely, and then her doing things for Seely that she'd never do for Sh Mista. Yeah, and instead they just focus on, they focus a lot on Sophia and on Harpo, um, Harpo and Squeak. And it's just like these characters that don't even matter. Like Squeak doesn't even show up in the second act. I don't think she's like, there. Not, she she goes. She not leaves very with, much. She leaves when Seely leaves alongside her and Shug. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't even remember that. That's how unimportant she is. Just like I don't know. It's like the story, the emotional beats are like there, but they're they don't play it up at all. And it just, it leaves you kind of wanting more. So let me rephrase my context for this. So I read the book when I was in high school, and I listened to the musical right after that, and I, I never <laughs> watched the musical until the revival came out many years later. So I just heard the songs and put the pieces in together where the book hit it. So I assumed that the book hit, the musical hit all the same beats as the book. And when I was wrong, when I finally did watch, I was really disappointed. And I'm still kind of am. And I know that's like me saying like the source material is better. But no, these songs are great. It It's just like make more of the source material the, with these songs and we're good. And I think that's what they're going to do with the Oprah Winfrey and Steven Spielberg produced movie of the musical that's coming out soon, apparently. Hopefully. Yeah, because I think that is a great opportunity to rework some of this to make it as emotionally resonant as possible. Yeah, because I, I feel like it could have worked. And like, I know I've already said that this this material is not exactly up my alley, but I that doesn't mean I don't think I could have enjoyed it. I just, as it is right now, it didn't really resonate with me in any real way. Because Andrew's a hater. Yeah, well, I don't know. And uh, I, I can't say I loved it, so. I say that I really wanted to love it, and that's kind of why I'm sitting here more disappointed with it. So what's, and, uh, what was that? I mean, I, I was just going to ask, what's your overall thoughts on it? I think it has some of the gr some great music, um, and it tries very hard to adapt the content of the book and keep some of the stylistic choices that the book makes. But I feel like the emotional beats still kind of fall hollow compared to like how they hit in the book. And it feels like a lot of the action isn't driven by the character's development as much as we're told this thing happens, so that causes the next thing to happen. Like, we're told something, and so the characters have a reaction to that instead of showing the thing and having them react to it. And that storytelling thing makes the emotional beats not as resonant to me. But these songs, these songs are powerhouses, and they're great. <laughs> yeah, I think that overall it's a disappointment, because I, I mean, I, I mean that I, what I said about the music style, and I feel like a lot of the songs do, they could have a lot of emotional, um like weight to them but the story doesn't lend it well the story does lend itself to it but the way they tell the story doesn't yeah um, and I, I i don't really know if that's the problem with like the medium of theater and maybe it might just be that like I'm i mean still it very well could be like writing some, that line some stories can't work on stage you know but like, i will admit at this when i did rewatch this most recently just today to prepare for this i did get a little emotional when nettie showed up at the end like i felt like <sighs> a little bit just because i remembered how it felt in the book yeah i guess i i didn't have that at all because i just kind of was just following with this and i didn't have any any real emotional attachment to any of the characters already so did you feel the plot was easy hard to follow or easy to follow because i i found it hard to follow when i read the book i think at, in the first act especially yes because it feels like there's a lot of characters and there's just stuff happens to each character and it's like what is okay so this is here and he's his son and then they're together and these two are together and and it's just, there's a lot of the stuff introduced really quickly that is tough to follow. But I think once you get to Act 2, it's a little bit easier. Yeah, I see that. But then, I we have this title character, Celia. Celie, not Celia. Um, and she's great. But you don't really know how the rest of the family unit sees her. Like, I think her and Harpo have, like, one interaction with one another. Yeah, I didn't even know that... <laughs> I didn't know that she was trying to raise him, honestly. Yeah, she she was brought in to raise her kid, his kids. Yeah, like that part of it didn't didn't hit at all. So he's obsten she's ostensibly his mother, and yet, and in the book, it's like a really t tense relationship where he doesn't he treats her basically the same way Mister does until they're much older and they kind of get a respect for one another. And here they they're fine. They they act decent to one another throughout. 
Like, that's the kind of dynamics, like, the very specific growth throughout the story that they just didn't focus on. Yeah. So at that point, if she, <laughs> if Harpo isn't affecting Seelie much, why is he here? Because frame it from the way that we have Seelie and the world's re- her reaction to everyone in the world. And if the world's not touching her or affecting her, why is it there? I feel like Harpo's honestly only there because they wanted to have Sophia be there, and without Harpo, there's no reason for Sophia to be there. Exactly. And then you also have to have the squeak thing, and it's, it's, and I don't want to complain because it's not bad. It isn't a bad musical. It's far from that. I just, I think it's a missed potential. I think it honestly would be better if they just cut it down a lot and had it be like Celia, uh, or Celie? Seely, yes. Seely. Seely, Nettie, uh, Mr. and Shrug, and Shug. Shug. Oh my god, god. I can't even talk right now because I'm in my throat, but... Have it be those four characters, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Like, just cut down everything else, because the other characters just don't need to be there. Or, if you are going to have them there, have them have a reason to be there. Yeah. Either cut 20 minutes or add 20 minutes. There are pros and cons for both. I'd say the better is to add 20 minutes and flesh these characters out with Seely, Because, basically, Harpo and Sophia are the only ones that talk to each other. Yeah. And that, that, that makes it not compelling at all. Um, okay, or just, Andrew, or they, what they is could... your cheese rating and your overall thoughts? I think I've we've pretty much already given our overall thoughts at this point, but I think it needs work. Um, I think the songs are generally very good, though, um, and the music style is very fitting, but the story just could have been told a lot better. Uh, cheese rating, I don't know. Give it a like, goat cheese. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, I... I am very conflicted about this because I really want to like it because I think the staging is great. I think the actors are great. I think the performances are good. I think the songs are great. I just, that story, like, I've seen it in a way that it was so compelling. And for this, I don't know why it just didn't compel me as much. It's like the reverse way I feel about Jane Eyre, where I feel the book is very dull and very, like, plain. But when Paul Gordon adapted into a musical, suddenly a lot of it hits a lot harder and more for me. Um, do you think it's the do you think it's the book like not the the book like the book for the the musical like do you think it's the the talking scenes and everything between there's the songs? not many talking scenes though the ones that they're like maybe that's it maybe we do need some like actual dialogue scenes or either more or less I don't think it would hurt to have some more dialogue scenes yeah and I think you need that connection to people like I think you need some silence so to say to take in, like, some of the darker shades of this. Because if everyone's, like, singing out, like, as much as I love singing and as much of a release it can be, it's hard to have tension while you're singing. Uh, cheese rating, what do you got? Um, I would give it some very nice French cheese, like, some of the, br- maybe brie, like, you know, it's it's good. Like, you put it in your mouth, it's really good, but it crumbles a little bit and a lot of it falls off the cracker. Fair enough. Like, oh, I like this, but no, no, we need more. Come on, come on, I need a little more. Come on, and you're just trying to shove it all on the cracker, but you get some on and the rest falls off. That's how I'd rate it. Like, oh, you're so good, but it's frustrating. I'll, yeah, you know what? I'll agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you guys for listening. I hope we didn't piss you all off because we have some interesting thoughts on the color purple. But you know what? Give us a review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher at Musicals with Cheese. We're on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals. Our Patreon is Musicals with Cheese. Our Instagram is Musicals with Cheese. Our YouTube page is Musicals with Cheese. Our email is MusicalTheaterLives at gmail.com. Send us some hate mail because of what we said about the color purple. We love hate mail. Um, our title card was created by the amazing Jolene Casco. Go send her some love at Jolene Casco. Andrew, is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up? We love you all, um, and I'm sorry I've been sick. Hopefully hopefully next week we'll get some really uh, top-notch recordings out there. Yep. You know I what I gotta it. say, Andrew? What's that? Hey, Andrew, what you gonna do? Going down by the river, gonna play with you. Oh, brown Betty. Man, I really hate being sick, though. I, I just can't I can't voice myself like I want to. Yeah. It really sucks. I, I, he looks so frustrated. The last two episodes um, were rough to get through, but we need to hit our deadlines. But next week, we're going to be back in our A game, folks. Yep. Watch and me I'll, be sick. <laughs> I'll be able to talk at full volume again and maybe actually laugh as well without 
coughing. <laughs> you mean me? I always cough when I laugh. Well, that's that's different. I don't. Jesse, you're dying. That's probably. true. We're all dying. Yeah. All right. We'll see you next time on Musicals with Cheese. <laughs>